Good morning, everybody. I'm Scott Micklin. This is KSJE on the road from downtown Farmington at the historic Tota Theater. We are provi providing live coverage of the Paths to Healing event that is taking place this morning throughout downtown Farmington. This is the latest uh, uh, part of this day-long event, which is taking place from the Tota Theater. So stay tuned. We'll be back with the program from the Tota in just a moment as things get started here on KSJE on the road. And uh, so Okoshi <laughs> Welcome. It is good to be here, and I want to recognize that for some people, it's hard to be here. My name is Liesl Dees, and I've been part of this events planning committee of relatives, activists, clergy, and community members. In addition to those of you in the room at the Tota Theater, we have friends joining us online through KSJE's Facebook page for real-time viewing. And for those of you who may be listening outside, there are still some seats inside if you would like to come in and join us. If you have folks who may want to um, watch but are not here with us, again, please encourage them to go to the Facebook page for KSJE, and you can see this in real time. It'll also be on KSJE's YouTube channel for later viewing. I have a statement to begin with to read from our mayor, Nate Duckett. Good morning, friends and neighbors. I apologize that I'm not able to be there with you today. I hope this message finds you and your families in good health and enjoy the abundance of beautiful fall days that are upon us. Thank you for gathering here today at the historic Tota Theater as we commemorate the 50th anniversary for a tragic chapter of an, in our history. We gather not just to remember, but to acknowledge the pain, the injustice, and the deep scars that this tragedy left on our community. The events of that time represent a part of our past that we must never forget, for it reminds us of the challenges we have faced together, of the mistrust, fear, and division that once marked our path. As much as we remember that painful past, we must also recognize the journey this community has made since then. Together, we have worked to heal, to grow, and to overcome. The strength of our regional community lies not in the hardships that we have endured, but in the resilience we have shown in moving forward, determined to build a better, more united future. As we look to that future, it's important to recognize that as a city that serves nearly 300,000 people throughout this region, we have all come from many places. We all have diverse stories and histories, but we are all here now, together. 
We are all members of this Greater Four Corners community, and I believe that our focus must be on the part that each of us plays in the creation of the new chapters of history that are being written today, tomorrow, and the years ahead. We have many challenges that face our community, but I know that working together, we can tackle the issues that are holding our families and our people back. But first, we must recognize that we are all part of this community, shaped by the same sun and wind of the Four Corners, and bound by a desire to create a better future for all who live here. Let us build upon our commonalities, our shared values of family, hard work, and respect for the land we call home. We all want to see our families thrive and our children prosper, and we all want to ensure that the generations to come will know this place is one of hope, unity, and opportunity. Together, we will continue to build that future, one rooted in our shared history and shaped by the common purpose that brings us here today. God bless you, your families, and the people of the Four Corners USA. Respectfully, Nate Duckett, Mayor. <laughs> Whether you are viewing remotely or gathered here in the Tota Theater, it is good to gather together to remember. James Baldwin wrote many years ago that we cannot change everything we face, but nothing can be changed until it is faced, until it is named, and until it is spoken out loud. We gathered together to remember 1974 and to name injustice. We gather to remember the long impact of racism on our community and to tell a truthful story of the dignity of all people who live here. We gather from diverse places as family members, directly impacted, as longtime residents, and as those just learning these stories to remember together, to remember together in community. And let us remember and travel together on a path of healing. Uh, Lizzo. I think Crowing Hima Stella Webster will yet you could also need an honesty. Yate. She is Stella Webster in chef. Now, Kaden and Schler, Kia Anne, Bashish Chin, Toddich Eatney, Aidash Che, Kapahi, Aidash Nale, Lades of the Bay Dent Nasha, nineteen sixty six, and out when Nahania. My husband came to work for the Bureau of Reclamation in 1966. That's when we moved to this area. In September of 2023, we at the First Presbyterian Church got a new pastor, Reverend James Clout. He's with us today. He had signed up to, for a program on the Doctrine of Discovery presented by the Northwest New Mexico chapter of Campaign Against Racism. I met with our new pastor to orient him to this community. Marsha Glass had given him the book, The Broken Circle. He's he had started reading it, and in January of 2024, Reverend James said to me, do you know it's been 50 years? Wow, has it already been that long? That's when our conversation started. We need to do something to commemorate the 50-year commemoration. That's how we started gathering people. Our committee became made up of amazing people. And we also met an amazing lady from the city of Farmington, Shannon Reeves. She is the Farmington assistant city manager. 
So this event would not have happened without those group of people coming together with the committee and the support of the city of Farmington. So when we started meeting, we developed a narrative and that was our guiding narrative as we plan this event. I will read an excerpt to you from that. We are a group of community members from Farmington and nearby communities seeking to acknowledge the 50th anniversary of the murders of the three Diné men in 1974. Ours is a twofold purpose to affirm the sacredness of every human life, regardless of color, ethnicity, culture, or origin, and to acknowledge the history of racism in the border town community that resulted in the torture and killing of these three Diné men. The other purpose is we want to see a permanent monument that's established to this uh, event. Yeah. Yeah. So. Thank you. Kiasma. Did um, the question Ashke <laughs> Epi <laughs> あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ
<coughs> Very briefly, as an overview, as part of my overview, the, uh, the reason why we're gathered here is, um, is for several reasons. One, obviously, is to commemorate that time in 1974 when, when a number of our, of our Dene people were, were brutally murdered. They were, they were, they were tortured. We want to remember them. We want to remember the victims, other victims that, that, that saw that same conclusion on their life. Then we also know very well that there are people who have left our homes that have never come back. We want to remember all those at this time. But that's not all. That's not, that's not the main reason why we're here. Another big reason is that we know that this, this scourge of racism is something that remains. We, we submit that the racism that is perpetrated on people of color is concentrated in the small segment of the community. There are people that are truly hateful of another people because they're different. There is that reality. Then we know that many people here in this community, in this um, heavy Anglo community that many people are just indifferent about those issues. At the same time, we also recognize that, uh, that there are people of good heart, people that, that understand humanity, that understand compassion, and we appreciate those people. We regard them as brothers and sisters. All of us here, brown skin, in our, in, at a time in our life, yes, we, 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 we were in good relation with, with people from different color. So the, the bottom line of, of, of what we need to do here is to state very clearly that we know that racism is alive and it continues. One of the reasons why, etc., 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 
One of the reasons why racism is alive is this business about white privilege. We know that white privilege is, is uh, maybe I'm overstating it a little bit, but I will say that it is prevalent in this community. White folks that have a, a negative thought about other people of color, they may not understand it, they may not realize that they are that way, but that, that is a reality. And we want to state that very clearly here. We talk about healing, and we, when we say that, we're talking about our families, our people. But when the mayor talks about healing, to what extent is he saying it? It's just not, we don't want it to be just words, like it's been words, just words for so long. We want this to be a, 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 a serious work to address a tremendously serious condition that this community has. Not only here, but other border towns throughout, the, throughout our land. I want to go ahead and um, uh, there's a, a narrative on the back. Um, can we uh, put the narrative on the screen? The narrative. Let's go there. Are you finding that narrative? We, ha we have to say that um, the city, the mayor's office, and the police department, the fire department, and uh, other people that are in this community, they did come out to help us. And you saw that. You saw that. Okay, we, we do appreciate that. able to find that narrative. If not, I can proceed. Oh. 
Okay. Det Tot <laughs> Do <laughs> Next. <laughs> E yaha e din hit a huin zenigi e e di chin hit el enigi et o e nas lio e ado e be be bahajoka. A godit a le na liha bada hoga nota a konda e na atloda e en hit a nchen da chis de la e yaha e huon jis. What is jis do dis jonsi dat a hot a konen le nat ata et a se e ben hana ste. Peso bin yea. A co eighty art quigushi, eighty le nineteen seventy four, don't not ah, a hidden net hitas, yay, hitas, nay, ye a hoodlo. A co sahed and nay, quay, eight at his skinny, eighty compass of a car, Deshna, Clarchish Chilich, Le Cadi Adosina, Gandesti, a late saga house under a pish was under none of being. Okay. Conchitanacode, <laughs> John Earl Harvey, Herman Dodge Benali, David Atnasio, Okay. <laughs> Esa eh could they didn't need. Eh, Shadda Lucy Kiswood, eh, eh, quay, eh, a large, eh, yah, eh, you cannot earn it. A law, eh, the American Indian movement, eh, nini, hakui, didn't need. The Narayas Alliance, eh, an hinhas, tui, an nato, ah, ne, kaya, pigito, eh, hot, ah, ah, hot, hunt, eh, le, bel, dealers, and the lamb, what the hot, ah, 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 
Aro in double ACP, a Dijeni, a Yisetra, a Yaha, 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 a a ape and not a coalition for Navajo liberation had no a tashap is jago a da heel sword. Ado de que nineteen seventy four, a da e quit a key, ne ne haban secret. Ado de na yaba da ho when nigga ate ado band da yasne, da he did no da e what ate za. Got as a ate ate to quit the more she ape in nan, ate hit the hot souls nigga ate, and not so on that oak. At the head, I shone of her pace as I hunt the hair at ten dozen. A coita a hotelia. A conle keda a sada shaja ea. A moment of the ne greatness. A eti a celestia Nahani yards. Norman Patrick Brown, are you in the house? Ita a she kept she kept a yazan long. What are a sad quitter? What is the end? Haya had the Dita, she need neho. The quit the meal she ate, she need neho. As a yego, a need zeal this. Ah, to know a equal Norman Patrick Brown, the Shinigin, Nahaya had the okay. A coy other a key need neho, a dequel, did not it so. Then he hit that queen, the Nigi dope, he hit open in nineteen hit at Enigi, as a shanas at Liga. Then in now one day, in other state or New Mexico, there are the eighty foot eh, the ne, the last like tribut at Enigi, Dishahigi, a quen had the house, Naya, Yego, Eya, a biscuit in the house, is ne. A quae ado be yet or she ate set as doll, yes, the Belagana. A co a apen in nan eighty quail hot a eight adon, not the eighteen hit el enne, eight the neat cloya, o it o is aunt a hashin zacher. A good ad a ya a quay a hashin so ad a a jo a shansi kiss a sheet as a what is jij. A con the deep a kagish chisney clinigi, eight and the eighty. La Washington, that over the gun, which was under a in a ya nick at the yan lick echo a a hat nature, Nicosic des, Nicosic des is hat nature. Et a what are in cases a good example. Eighty ultra has under ya and lay what lay Washington, it is a hot a nun kindle. So that the is to never your horse at all. Had no ever has on a hollow. Even hit a chis. On hit a nanny, lenigi, but Kagis, Lizany, lenigi, Dean Hash, Sene, old has argy. On hin hin neck, echo, eh, oh, dos, ahigi, Edo Ben Hartus Ada. Ehut are as near. Out of quiet racism, Ninigi eighty. At the Snedia, Dibel Gana Hashin, Hashin, La Eti do ya had shita, do do he do e jo e yan se kista. Dinana shat the nabat bakagi e e e sahot, e he sahot, a e he nanigi benin nan, but the easiness the nigi, e di e asna, e qua e betat el slats le. Oko this jid e di kone hik e hot a ti da li ai gi do bi e dan li ni gi ba chen ba zao ke ba na le ke e kone e ya e ba he ni zhen do kue e ya e da e e xia do ha shen na e bi ni no e kone e bi li gi kai. Oko a do e ya e kudo e ba yi ti e di do a da e de ya da. The Nashat Anne his aunt, the house, Kande, Kodisha, Aji and Dadness, the murdered, missing indigenous woman. No, a Yegum, Sa, a Nanashnat, Adonana, murdered, missing, the ne relative. A quen Nanashnat, Egi Yegum, but Skeegi, that a deep in the Nan, what are his Anigit, Andy, what are a Chahil, though at Chahna Ilagas. 
Okay, <laughs> Dal <laughs> Kudo <laughs> Quiet racism. Okay, ah, uh, okay, I think that's the end of the slides. Kuroe Yahadit Shama Esther Ee Yaha Ita Ita Ah 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 Ita yego nan sedat zai ge e e e ti as atra alante atra na ho atra sa ho ji e si ko e ya e a a han so de e ni 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 kat na do le okay yeah uh, good morning everybody so, um, as Chile indicated, my name is Esther Keyswood, and um, I was a young woman, like you said, in um, 1974. I won't say how old I was. <laughs> um, so, the first time we ever heard of my uncle, my uncle was John Earl Harvey, and my cousin, Herman Dodge Benali were uh, killed April 20th, 1974 in Choke Cherry Canyon here in Farmington. Their bodies were found the next day, April 21st, 1974 by family. Uh, they were out on an outing. Akodide ashtadina khayeda April 20th, 1974. John Earl Harvey was here. To Nikhizer Shinjalin, Herman Dodge, to Ea, Abi, and the nephew, 
she came to our house in Hogback. We, we lived in Hogback. And um, Jane came to our house and asked my mother, Sister, help me. Let's do something about it. I'm not going to let it go, she says. And right away, my mother um, says, okay, I don't know where to start. I don't know where to go. Let's go to Shiprock. We visit some of our elder uh, leaders down there. And, and then one, one um, gentleman named Alfred Shorty recommended that we talk with Jimmy Anderson. Jimmy Anderson is uh, an uncle paternal uncle to Larry Anderson. He says he, he might know something how to get AIM over here. I think they're the only ones that can help us, he says, because we sent work to Peter McDonald. Peter McDonald was chairman at the time. Nothing, nothing that came of that. So we knew that our tribal leaders at that time wouldn't help us. So we, we, um, Jane Besenti Jay Hanago, but she asked what is she? A co eighty gay ha, Latin Hania, Shadok and he can't lead. She can't lead. Hit out a deal next leader, and he'd lahan his answers here. The old, the obit is netta, didn't need. A aro a ha, um, Halit Aro Les <laughs> no Joan Lee, not Anni, Nezo Yang, Ilwado, Sashin, the ideal kiddo. Hurling he caught all was at no. Junde A. Alfred Shorty, Julian A. the Banani Kajo A. Navajo Right Association, Yil Tahi Kaha. They were better husband than they, Jimmy Anderson Bano, Ka A. B. Yet. Um, A. Miss Nakri Aja, A. Quet the Quidishi, Nakai Kaino. A. Ishi, he caught a door, Jan, his Nila. So we got in contact with Jimmy Anderson, and, um, and he, we, we told him what the situation was, and after a while he says, okay, I'll get in uh, contact with Larry, and come back in a couple of days, he told us. So we went back to talk with him, and Larry was there. Um, he's not here today with us. He's uh, elderly, um, not able to travel very far. So I, I have been in contact with him, though. Okay, aro e Larry Anderson, ige e aron haniya. I see a hash keen long star. A co e hot a e ha biscuit in the house in a cochina. Dean lay a large at Nazinigin lay St. Paul, Minnesota, are a de aim but Oshajor are the nila. Bilch had a desse. A Russell Means, though, Dennis Banks, Aro, um, Vern, though, Clyde Belcourt, the Dahlia. A bitch had desse nila. So when we met with Larry, he said he was going to talk with his um, other leaders uh, by the name of Russell Means. You probably heard that name. He's also deceased. Dennis Banks, also deceased. Vernon Clyde Belcourt. And they're all uh, the headquarter of uh, American Indian Movement is at St. Paul, Minnesota. So... A week later, he, um, that, well, that same week, uh, Larry got back in contact with his, he says, okay, I'm going to go down there, I'm going to get a parade permit, he says. So we went with him, we came to Farmington and got a parade permit with him. And um, our first march uh, that we did was May 4th, 1974. And he says, people are already coming right now, he says, they're in caravans, uh, vehicles, they're all coming down, a lot of them are coming from Pine Ridge. And the incident had just occurred with Windut Nee, so everybody's really fired up, right? They want to come down and help the Navajo people down here. <laughs> they weren't afraid. <laughs> so, Ada Jo Niri Ada Tabana Aste, a Windut Nee, what a take over the land there. 
some of them are also at Fred's house too. Uh, I think Tutsi and Kareen were um, feeding them too over there, all these AIM people, AIM boys over there. So, on May 1st, 1974, is when the three teenagers were arrested. Um, two of them were 16 years old, one was 15. Jo e le Farmington High School, the shin ada da ostha. Um, the kishi bila hesh kijo ada elche inde ilgachin shi kik ada tlo. Di e e ha the nesha andasil sked. Di e bila ad eda no. Akona kait e che hawana zaro ada ba mai shoz ne. Di shi kheko da ne din le de e ha the nena sked ki it eno shi. May 11th uh, was our second march. Oh, you by then. Fred Earl Johnson is one of them. John Redhouse. He's sitting right down here. John Redhouse. And then we also... Uh-huh. Yeah, sit down. <laughs> Billy Cleaver uh, from NAACP. Do we have anybody from his family that are here representing him or representative from NAACP? Okay, we tried to get in contact with him. He is now living in Tyler, Texas, very elderly too. And then um, Reverend Henry Burt, son is here, I think. Mr. Burt, are you still here? Oh, Jalwadia, okay. All right. Um, Henry Burt was a um, real helpful person at that time. He was um, a priest, I think, over here at the San Juan Episcopal Church up here by the Bistahi. San Juan Mission, Gia. In his reverend, yeah, in his thought, Nashi had this day. You and he caught another one, Benina. They sent him away once they found out he was, uh, we were meeting over there at his church and all that. He was a big supporter of us. And they shipped him off during, during these marches. But um, we appreciate him, you know, everything he did for us. Arodi, the city of Farmington, Eha, we did 10 um, lists of demands to them because nobody was really. No Native Americans, I should say, was um, employed for the city of Farmington, and hardly any. And then there's no Native American on the city council. The Indian Center was such a, a joke at that time. It was a small, even, it was even with a, a bus station, and they were calling that an Indian Center. So we asked them to improve that as well, too. So. Mr. Burt. Dida Atlishna, this is uh, Henry Burt's son right here. So, okay. He's here representing his father. So, do I see the Neda Dida Kwe Siri farming to Nedo Nenda Nishta, the Hodi, no, a mayor Jalini Gita in Alsons. Marlowe he says, that's just a gathering place for people coming into Farmington. Now you're asking for a clubhouse that he didn't need at one of our meetings. Are you on the highest key? I call, mayor, you know, back then, Marlowe Webb. So, 
Sashin is better as a Arden the Sokaya. So Aro, um, June 8th, go eha. Um, well, let me back up. June 7th, June 7th, go eha. All three, these three boys, the Gia, they were, um, they were sentenced to uh, New Mexico Boys School at Springer. At then, only ha shin pen da osh khat olesh oh don ni da da shere to e wali ha oh do ni sta don ni e aren de sa na si tli le as tight ba hun ba da hun o o da da hi ne sti ni hi do ya di khat eh no to taran khis na chin ya je oh da za e bin na e hi don hi de ir den khis no o o da ni la the kui the kui shin ska ha da ba da hun to so um, June 8th Eha, is a day that uh, we were denied permit, a marching permit, because there was a Sheriff Posse rodeo. And um, so some of us didn't come, come to Farmington. We did something else. But um, I think John was the first one there, and um, Fred was there, um, Lorenzo Livaldo. Taff Scott, Eddie, that Hege Ajit Ekredo, they stopped the parade because there was cavalry in there. They didn't finish, the sheriff posse didn't finish their parade. So, there were several arrests from that incident. And um, we got, let's see, the next day, next two days we're raising funds and then we got everybody out. And then um, I think John is the one who hired um, Toulouse, uh, James B. Toulouse out of Albuquerque. It's a private law firm called um, Toulouse, Crable, and Cheney. And they represented all the leaders that were arrested and anybody else that was arrested on uh, pro bono, that means that um, they didn't even have, we didn't even have to pay them any fees. So I don't know if, if um, anybody is here from the uh, Maggie Toulouse's office. She's a secretary of state now, that's the granddaughter. Oh, okay. Stand up. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for coming. A koe a gadi ahi idelia di koe um kitrahi da hi jo grand jo e ha binina ge e ha di um sheriff e ha e da e alia na kyo parade akun a day la do bishi e ha bistan jono da zoho la si akun e kido eskidan la ha. Well, they gone nine hit as caro. I put out our cavalry, they send the gear as a law, the last chin that's all yeah. Eighty gear that oh, and they couldn't all touch in. Is she age on J. She care, the head or da, or I see on her that law, no she. J. Aro quit that he joke, Aro, um, or you have it is nil. Aro e na kije e peso a deil neho a shkine kaho e aro mandiko e aro nani kido e aaj e da si nil. A lot di da he Jane B. Toulouse liago e ha e aro e aajik e pido bitse aajik e nke ka e jeo deil skoj e da kot is nil do a so ha da ho inst in. Jo e nle e nle da si ke da zi e ha a bitso ke e da e la ashto e aro e ha koda ba di nido aro na ha na aaj. So um, <clears throat> that's kind of a, a narrative. Um, there's a lot to, to talk about, but I'm not going to just go on and on. Um, I would like to recognize um, my Aunt Mary, Mary Johnson. Go ahead and stand up. Can you stand up? D.A. Fred, Fred Johnson, um, who's his wife. <laughs> and, the, and her girls, Kareen. Tootsie, can you guys stand up? Okay. (laughs) 
These girls were like 10 and 11 or 12 years old at that time. They were just young girls, and they'd be walking down the street with us. <laughs> and then my Aunt Jane, Ashbigahin Zionshama. Jane Besenti is right here. <laughs> and then uh, family members, family members stand up too. Family members, folks. Stand up. That's it. Elvin. Also have um, Herman Dodge Benali, his family. Ben, where are you? Oh, Ben Benali. Oh, he was sitting here. He must have went out. Can you go ahead and just stand up? Whoever came with him, stand up. Yeah. These are the same family. Yeah. Okay. And then, um, I think that'll be the end of my speech right now. I just wanted to have you all recognize that. And then my mother, as I indicated, she was the very... Um, person that started this whole w with Jane um, they started this whole marches and g getting American Indian movement here I would like to recognize my family Keyswitz, my, my husband and Mr. Begay you go ahead and stand up Elvin Delvin, where are you? you stand up Andrew, stand up Andrew, stand up my husband here yeah, yeah. It's my family here Bertrand, would you guys stand up? Bertrand, Aiden, it's my grandson, Shanalit Edid, huh? I think he's following my footsteps. I actually eat Okay. Um, I believe that's it. I think um, I covered everybody here. Thank you. I can't do it. I can't As uh, we are recognizing other families, uh, the family of uh, David Ignacio. Please stand. Other family that I know is here is um, the mother and some of the um, uh, siblings of uh, Clint John. Clint John is the one that was killed in 2016 by a white Farmington police cop. D, where are you? D, easy. We want to. Say hello to you. As a family. And uh, we, like we say, uh, there are others, there are many other victims that, that we that uh, suffered at the, at the, because of this racism. Okay, so uh, now we want to go to um, our brother, um, John Redhouse. All the way from Pyramid Lake, Nevada. Thank you. Brother Kelly and Sister Esther, uh, 50 years, and uh, uh, it actually, uh, Indian killing, white Indian killing, goes back to at least uh, in this area, at least to the 1870s, when uh, 
the white settlers moved down from north uh, after dispossessing the, uh, the Utes, Ute Mountain Ute, Southern Ute of their gold, and put them on tiny, uh, tiny reservations. Uh, and, and they came, you know, they, they already had a history of, uh, of Indian killing and stealing land. And there were Navajos that were living here in the uh, middle San Juan River Valley already. Uh, many of them never went uh, to Fort Sumner, Bosque Redondo. They hid out uh, over here and Glade Roya and, and other places. So they were still, they were still here. And uh, they had uh, farms, they had grazing areas here. It was, uh, in fact, uh, in reality, and in ph physically, it was, uh, it was Navajo land, Tota Navajo land. And in 1876, uh, uh, the, this area was uh, opened up to what they called the public domain, even though it was Indian land. And then that's when the settlers really uh, started swarming in. And uh, it wasn't long, it was in the late 1870s, that they began their uh, their Indian killing. They already, you know, they already chased out uh, uh, our people and, and chased them out of the valley and and up into the dry plateau where you couldn't uh, you couldn't farm, you couldn't graze uh, because of uh, uh, lack of access to water. Here they had the San Juan River, uh, and uh, back then uh, Indians weren't regarded as uh, as human beings, we were considered, much like today, we were considered as less than human. And uh, over here on Main Street, uh, 1880, uh, they started shooting Indians uh, target practice. And that is documented in some of the history books. And uh, that, yeah, uh, that, uh, that's where it really began. Uh, and we didn't, uh, we didn't really uh, take that. Like uh, in 1974, we rose up. There was this chief, Black Horse. He, g he gathered about uh, 1,000 Navajos. And they came over here and they said, give up those Indian killers or we'll destroy this town. Now, that's not AIM talking. That's not CNL talking. It was our brave resistance leaders that we're talking back then. And they had a thousand warriors ready to back up their horse. We had a warrior society back then. It was that warrior society that uh, AIM, United Native Americans, National Indian Youth Council, modeled their activism on. It wasn't something that just came up as a result of the Civil Rights Movement in the 1950s and 1960s. It goes back to 1870. To 1942 or 181492. Uh, That's where the resistance began with the first invasion. And there were many, there were many victims there. A lot of our people fought and died during those resistance wars, and they too need to be included in the victims because they paid, they made the ultimate sacrifice in protecting the land and the people. So we need to put this in historical context, geographical context, and in continental hemispheric contents. Since 1492, 98%, over 98% of the Indian people that live here wiped out, killed, invasion, disease, colonization, the deadly conditions that we're subjected to. It all goes back 98 uh, percent. It's estimated that the, what's the continental United States, uh, there were 12 million Indian people living. And by the late uh, 1900s, there's only less than 250,000 of us. Now that's genocide, and it's continuing. With every Indian that they kill, that's the continuation of that genocide. The Indian wars are not over. We know that. So when white people 
say that there's, you know, there's no more racism, there's no more genocide, that's not true. That's not true. They've never been on the receiving end of racism and hate crimes. We are the only ones that have standing and truth to make that statement. In 1974, 50 years ago, the city of Farmington was the enemy of the people, of the resistance movement. They didn't think, they didn't think that, uh, you know, they thought that the district attorney, the assistant district attorneys, uh, would bring justice. Uh, let the courts settle it. You guys uh, uh, don't make trouble. And, uh, and they called me uh, an outsider and a troublemaker. And uh, that, that wasn't true. I grew up in Farmington. I was born and raised here. I knew Farmington uh, from the 1950s from the early 1950s to late 1970s. Went to had this big, tall, mean-looking white man. I think he was a store manager or something. Follow his Navajo kids around. You know, we, we'd go in there, and, you know, it was a variety store. And, you know, we'd, you know, we wanted to buy marbles or something like that, or get marbles, or, you know, just, just browse selectively, browsing. Uh, and uh, he'd follow us around. And they would do that to, uh, to Navajo families as well. Mothers and grandmothers with their kids going there, they were followed too. They didn't do that to the, uh, to the white families. They didn't do that to the white kids. Well, we were being racially profiled and, and followed around. Those white kids could have been shoplifting right there. You know, the reason they, you know, you, you were already presumed guilty of being shoplifters. That's why they, you know, they, they followed us around. It was that, that race since the day. And I remember that distinctly. And when I was in high school, uh, the racial slurs started. This, uh, this white kid uh, called me a savage, so I beat him up. I gave him a, I gave him a savage beating. Uh, yeah, yeah. That's Navajo power, that's Indian power. And this other uh, kid uh, called me an effing Navajo, and I beat him up too. Uh, so, you know, that was uh, part of growing up here. Uh, and this was before the, 19, before the 1970s. And I, you know, I first heard of hate crimes, uh, attempted vehicular homicide uh, of a mother. Uh, and uh, uh, that was the first time, you know, I heard it. You know, I thought, boy, this is getting serious. You know, she escaped with her, her life, similar to uh, Stella and James Webster uh, situation back in 1971. And, uh, and other similar incidents. So they not only use their fists, they, don't, they not only pick on intoxicated people and outnumber them, they always outnumber us, you know, three to one, uh, two to one, like that. You know, they're cowards. And, uh, but uh, in 1967, 1968, uh, I used to uh, spend a lot of time in the Indian section of town, which was uh, the heart of the uh, Indian section of town, was Broadway and Barron, going all the way to the railroad tracks, uh, Elm, Elm Street, and a little bit to a block to the right and a block to the left. And uh, I felt comfortable there. You know, you don't always feel comfortable here in F Town if you're if you have dark skin, you're in Navajo. And uh, I felt comfortable among my people. And I would talk to them. Uh, you know, a lot of them from the uh, checkerboard area, where David Ignacio came from. And, uh, you know, and of course from, you know, from Kirtland, Kirtland, Shiprock. And uh, that's where they felt comfortable at. And they would talk about these hate crimes. Uh, you know, they call them hate crimes, you know, just uh, these white teenagers would come out uh, midnight. And they'd, uh, they would kidnap and, and beat our people. I remember uh, seeing you know, a number of people that just disappeared. They were there one weekend, you know, decent people. They had problems with alcohol, yeah, uh, uh, considering the historical trauma and what they had to go through. Uh, that, uh, and and, and uh, I said, they would just disappear. I said, you know, what happened to you know, the, that older lady there that uh, uh, said she was from Escrito or something? What would happen? Did she go back home? Um, and it just happened, happened too many times. There was a pattern, a pattern of hate crimes. So don't think that this 1974 incident 
was an isolated incident because it goes way back and it's a pattern. And uh, racial hatred uh, and, and They, uh, you know, you know, we need to, you know, we need to, to, to look at it like, you know, well, you know, 50 years ago, and you know, that, you know, that was a bad time, and you know, uh, we can, you know, uh, we can let bygones be bygones, or you know, you know like the city of Farming said, the boys will be boys. Uh, they were just blowing out steam, you know, uh, trying to minimize uh, those hate crimes, uh, the violence, and those racial slurs. Uh, it's part of, uh, those are outgrowths of uh, ingrained racism that's been here since the 1870s. And it, uh, it manifests itself in different ways, but it's still there. Uh, and uh, the last encounter I had was in 2012 over at uh, Olive Garden. So this white uh, redneck oil worker started making statements and... Uh, uh, you know, you know, he was talking to his wife, but he was making it loud enough so that uh, so that I would hear it, uh, me and my wife, and uh, you know, it was delivered, and uh, so I started uh, countering him, and uh, I thought we were going to come to blows, we we're going to we we're going to have it out. Finally, I just said, let's get out of this place, because uh, he, he was drunk. He was uh, probably late 30s. I was in my early 60s then. And uh, if we went out to the parking lot, uh, he would have probably beat me up because uh, he was bigger and he was younger. And he was, uh, uh, you know, I was old guy, young guy, old guy there, grandpa. And, uh, uh, but uh, I went out to the parking lot and I waited for him. He never showed up. And even though I, you know, there was a good chance that I, you know, I would have probably gotten beaten up. I wasn't going to back down. We should never back down. We should fight racism with our lives. In 1974, uh, I think Esther and uh, Esther and Chile gave a, a fine summary of, uh, of, what, of the events, the chronology of, of the events that took place then. And uh, I came up, uh, I started working on this, Larry Emerson and I, our Kiva Club, Larry being from uh, Hogback, uh, you know, and I have the farming roots. We, you know, we, were the, we took the lead with the UNM Kiva Club getting involved in the formation and uh, continuation of the Coalition for Navajo Liberation. And uh, so we held a press conference down in Albuquerque and uh, made statewide, uh, statewide news. It wasn't only the UNM Kiva Club, but also a UNM Native American Studies Center, uh, the National Indian Youth Council, the American Indian Movement. And we, it was a unified uh, condemnation of the racism, and uh, we called for full racial justice that made statewide news. And then uh, I, was, uh, I was asked to uh, organize a press conference up here, and that's where uh, we had a press conference up here at the Farmington Indian Center. You know, a small place, but it was packed. And uh, uh, that's where I, I first uh, heard uh, Lucy Keyswood speak, and uh, she electrified the audience. Uh, you know, uh, just the oratory, the feeling. She was a natural leader. Larry Anderson was there, and uh, and others. And uh, we were going to do something about it. Uh, you know, we, we had no faith in uh, border town justice. When it when has it ever worked in our favor? Never. There's a double standard of justice. So we're going to make this part of a larger issue and, you know, and, and put things in historical context. The Indian killing, the continuation of genocide. So yeah, and that's, uh, it was that, that revolutionary spirit that, uh, uh, that, that, that gave birth to this modern Navajo civil rights movement. Uh, and Coalition for Navajo Liberation was, uh, uh, was uh, made up of different organizations and we... It wasn't just one person, one leader, one spokesman, but we had collective leadership. We had group leadership. And uh, many, uh, uh, I, I might go back and, and mention uh, uh, the Farmington uh, 
Uh, it was at the Farmington Indian Center. We had the UNM Kiva Club, and we had uh, uh, American Indian Movement, Jimmy Anderson, Larry Anderson, Lorenzo Lavaldo, uh, and, uh, and, and others, Urban Keyswood, who's a young man, and of course Esther, and Lucy, and Mary Wallace, and others. Um, and then we had uh, NAACP, uh, Billy Cleaver, Reverend Billy Cleaver, and Alma Arnold of, uh, of the same group. And I knew, uh, uh, in growing up, I knew uh, uh, two of her sons. Uh, and, you know, the Indian section of town was also south of the railroad tracks, which were most of the blacks and, uh, and uh, Hispanics uh, lived, you know, it was a poor part of town. And, uh, and also the San Juan County Human Rights Co Committee. Henry Bird was the, uh, uh, was the chair of that. Uh, there was Jim Fassett and his wife, Sarah. Um, and then there were other uh, white allies that, uh, that uh, not only sympathized us with, but uh, supported uh, many of our demands, particularly as it related to uh, building a real Indian center here and having a real alcoholism rehabilitation center here. Needed services, uh, much needed services. They weren't radical. They weren't talking about... Uh, you know, burning down City Hall or anything like that. We were about constructive, positive change. And we were about solutions and alternatives. But there was no dialogue. Uh, the, city, uh, uh, the city was totally opposed to us. Uh, uh, it's a whole different, uh, you know, it's much different than it is today, uh, in which the, you know, the, the city is uh, at least extending us uh, some courtesy and some respect here. It would have been impossible in 1974. Uh, the mayor, the mayor, uh, one of the city councilmen that said that uh, uh, the only way to handle these militants is to shoot them. And, uh, uh, you know, and, then, and other uh, businessmen were talking in those terms too. Uh, made it look like they were being, you know, they were circling the wagons or something. And, uh, yeah, but they were the ones talking, you know, about violence, advocating violence. Uh, all of our marches were peaceful and legal. And then when we did the civil disobedience over here on Main Street, they were the violent ones. It was a police riot. Uh, and we were out there. You know, Lorenzo was the leader. He said uh, uh, when, we, when we blocked the... Uh, uh, blocked the car in front of the cavalry unit, Lorenzo said uh, to the policeman that came up, uh, we want to meet with the, uh, the, with the Grand Marshal, and we want to tell him to remove that, uh, that car, you know, that, 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 uh, that racist uh, uh, cavalry unit. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, of course, they refused and just turned it into a, an arrest situation. You know, five seconds to disperse, it will start throwing tear gas, and that's what they did. And that created, uh, you know, the riot, and they already, you know, they already had the riot sticks out and the tear gas mask on and everything. And they're the ones that did it. Uh, and then as far as uh, uh, my dealings with the police then, uh, I went across to where that Russell Fouts Indian room is, uh, Indian room is over here on the corner. They had flight glass windows there. And uh, uh, they pointed me out uh, as being one of the, troublemakers or something, and I, you know, I would just, you know, I along with the three others just, you know, stood there and we stood our ground. It was, it was civil disobedience. It was nonviolent. They're the ones that made it a violent situation. And uh, so they come running, you know, they spot me out and they come running over, uh, you know, about ten of them, I would say, they started running over, waving their nightsticks. And, uh, you know, I, you know, I, I was outnumbered, you know, I wasn't going to you know, surrender or anything. I just stood there and, you know, was going to let them arrest me. I knew there were uh, cops over on this side here, uh, so I wasn't going to try to run. Uh, I was just going to uh, deal with the situation. So I thought they'd, uh, you know, uh, arrest me, read me my rights, and, you know, put me into the, in the squad car. No, they came running at me, and uh, the, 
several of them tried to push me through the plate glass window. And uh, uh, I didn't let them do it. Uh, I knew something about uh, martial arts. They did a judo move, did some misdirection, and used their weight and their momentum against them. And two of them went through the plate glass window. But there were too many of them. There were too many of them. And, uh, you know, they, they, uh, a, cop, uh, a cop who I never saw came up behind me and, and uh, uh, tried to break my windpipe, my windpipe there. And others were trying to uh, get me handcuffed. And the, the cop, you know, again, you know, didn't expect my misdirection or whatever, and I just pulled it down like that. You know, because he was a, you know, he'd have broken my windpipe if I had let him. I wasn't going to let him do that. I had a little bit of resistance uh, left in me. So, you know, I pulled it down. I was, you know, I was bigger then, uh, uh, six foot, 200 pounds, and, you know, I, I, could, I could match those guys on a one on one situation. But, uh, and then, you know, the cops came, and uh, more cops came, and they handcuffed me. If they had handcuffed me, and the, and the guy had put his, night, put his nightstick back up, he would have, he would have broken my windpipe. Yeah. And uh, all for surrendering, you know, all for, you know, Getting arrested, okay, it's civil rights, uh, you know, civil disobedience, so, so I expect some consequences, yeah. But, uh, uh, and, you know, others, uh, Taft Scott and Johnny Claw were also on this side here. And uh, instead of reading my rights, they just uh, grabbed us, the three of us, and uh, threw us into the back of the squad car there, like that. You know, you're supposed to read first in the rights and then... You know, ease them in, so, you know, you know. But no, they just threw us right in there, and, you know, you know, they hit my head there, and they didn't read us the rights, and the guy turned around, and, you know, I said, uh, well, uh, I won't say what he said. Uh, you know, it's, it's the white guys cussing, using those, those dirty, uh, dirty uh, foul language there. And but the bottom line was that he uh, threatened, uh, threatened to kill us. He said, you... Uh, I won't say it. You, you, you guys, ask for it now, and I don't care who we call in. We're gonna kill all of you, and then you know that ugly uh, white man F word. Uh, uh, we'll kill all of you, F and Indians, and, uh, and then they took us up to the uh, city hall, and you know there were others who were arrested. There were 33 of us that were arrested. But uh, what I want to say is that uh, all of our marches were, uh, were peaceful and legal. They were trying to agitate the situation. They'd show up at some of our marches with their, their nightsticks all lined up. And, you know, it's, uh, it's, you know, it's showing on some of the photographs here. Uh, their show of force and trying to provoke us uh, into, into doing something, you know, falling into their hands, basically, so they could arrest us and brutalize us that they've had a history of doing to our people for, you know, for years and years. Uh, and, you know, it you know, became a legal defense situation. There were 33 of us arrested, and uh, Esther talked about uh, Jim Toulouse, and we had very helpful people uh, helping us out in addition to the, the, the people that, uh, that Larry Anderson, Lorenzo Lovaldo, and others uh, uh, mobilized. And, of course, Lucy, uh, our uh, dear sister, Lucy Keeswood, uh, the oratory, they could mobilize a lot of people. I think there were probably a thousand people uh, camped out uh, over at the San Juan San Juan Mission there, and uh, they were just watching to see if anything happened to us. Yeah, you because know, you know lives are being threatened. Uh, we didn't attack them; uh, they attacked us, and they, they overreacted. They're supposed to be well trained, uh, and they failed. But it became a legal situation. We brought in Jim Toulouse, uh, uh, and. Uh, uh, well-known uh, civil rights attorney, criminal defense attorney, and uh, we went on the legal defense and on the legal offense. They tried to uh, keep us from marching. The city of Farmington tried to keep us from marching, and uh, you know, we have a constitutional right to do that. So it took about a month of, uh, of uh, litigation and negotiation, but we won the right to, to march the streets of Farmington. We did that throughout the summer. The press, the press, you know, we're bringing out all kinds of things in addition to the uh, uh, 
the lack of justice uh, for the, uh, the the families of the victims. I mean, those kids, uh, yeah, were, you know, very light sentence. You know, got sent to Springer, uh, and you know, for a few easy years, they were probably shooting pool and bragging about the, the murders. They weren't going, you know, they weren't going to be rehabilitated because they were part of this culture, this white culture. Not only here, but in all of the border towns. Uh, there's no such thing as an Indian-friendly border town. No such thing. Not only are they sitting on stolen Indian land, that's why we call them settler colonists, but, uh, uh, you know, they, they exert, uh, you know, they, they, they abuse uh, uh, their right to, to be here and to uh, interact with us in a peaceful way. Uh, we weren't asking for trouble. Uh, you know, the trouble was already here. Uh, so I wasn't an outsider, and I wasn't a troublemaker. Uh, and, uh, you know, you know, I, I, uh, I did, uh, did help the, uh, the leaders, uh, you know, Lucy and Fred and, and uh, and Chile and, uh, the others, uh, uh you know, because we had a, you know, we had a, we had a central committee, Coalition for Naval Liberation, and made up of the representatives and leaders of those, uh, groups. And, you know, the blacks and, uh, uh, the white human rights people, they, they, had, uh, they had their own set of concerns. Uh, and, uh, you know, but we, when we marched on City Hall, we, we presented an organizing United Front. And yes, uh, the first march was uh, 4,000 people, according to Larry Emerson. And uh, the subsequent marches, uh, three, well, two, 3,000 before the riot. We had five consecutive uh, marches, mass marches showing real Navajo power. Uh, and that's what uh, Norman, Norman, that's why Norman Patrick, uh, <clears throat> Norman Patrick Brown talked of the, uh, uh, the days of greatness, the days of greatness. And uh, he, was, uh, he was only 14 years old then. He joined AIM in 1973, involved in the Oglala shootout in 1975. Uh, Leonard Peltier. Leonard Peltier was uh, Leonard Peltier. Uh, I think we all know of him. He's our hero. And uh, in uh, 1970, he worked in the Page area, construction. There's a lot of construction there. And he would come to Farmington sometimes, and he would stay at that Avery Hotel over here, you know, three-story building over here. And uh, he says in one of his writings or one of the interviews that he witnessed a policeman beating an Navajo. And he yelled out at the policeman to stop, but he wouldn't. So he knew uh, what this town was about. And Norman Patrick, uh, you know, fought shoulder to shoulder with Leonard Peltier in the invasion of the Jumping Bull compound and defended uh, the elders and the children there. Uh, so we have another hero there, Norman Patrick Brown. But at a very young age, yeah, he saw, he saw the thousands of people and the oratory and the power and the words. And that was a, that was a, a time of greatness. And Farmington hasn't really seen that uh, probably since uh, Black Horse. Uh, you know, the Black Horse, uh, you know, we don't call it rebellion. It, you know, it was for the right reasons. And... Farmington hasn't seen anything since the long, hot summer of 1974. And uh, it was, you know, we were outraged. We were shocked. We were angered. But not only for the, uh, you know, the three victims, but we know those victims, uh, there are many. Uh, and they related to them. They identified uh, other, other victims of the racial hatred because uh, there were many, many more. A lot of hate crimes. Where do they bury them? Up in the bluffs. Oh. Choke Cherry Canyon. West of the Plata Highway. Those are the killing fields. And there's a literal boneyard of Navajo hate crime victims in those hills. And so, you know, we, you know we're, we're talking, uh, you know, mass, mass murder. Uh, here, it's, uh, you know, just continuing. There's no, there was no reason for it. And, 
Although it, it may not be that bad now, it still continues. Uh, I've been back here many times in the course of my work and uh, encountered different kinds of racism. And uh, uh, 2012, well, I already relayed that, 2012. In any case, uh, you know, I, in 1974, I didn't come here to make trouble. I came up here because I was asked to, uh, to help organize. And uh, I didn't just stick around and, you know, think up things to, uh, you know, to make trouble on. I was working over here, San Juan County Economic Opportunity Council. I was a summer intern. Uh, I was researching a subject called Indian Lifestyles in a Reservation Border Town, focusing on the employment issues. That's uh, the main reason why uh, our people uh, who can't make a living on the reservation, 65% uh, unemployment rate, come to the board towns uh, to find work. So it was very important uh, in, in, uh, uh, in that project to have uh, good basic uh, data for that so you can build a uh, set of recommendations or at least an agenda uh, to make to improve the lives and future of our people. We care about our people. We love our people. They're flesh of the same flesh, blood of the same blood. It's like the three victims. You know, they're our, you know, they're our brothers. And uh, an attack on one, an attack on all. And so it was uh, the people out in the streets, the thousands of people out, out in the streets, it was total unity, total unity. And uh, you know, it's it really unbelievable, uh, those, those five those five weeks. And for a young man, Norman Patrick Brown, to see that, to hear oratory, Fred Johnson, Lucy Keyswood, bringing out the best in us, their words, bringing out the best in us. And they weren't just words, they were out uh, in the streets with us. And so, uh, you know, it, it, it's a time to you know, not only reflect on, but uh, you know, it's an important part of our history. And it should be properly documented and properly recorded uh, with a Navajo context. A Navajo context. Broken Circle, written by a white man, written for primarily a white readership. There's no Navajo context. There's no feeling uh, there. Makes a lot of uh, money with book royalties, and then there are opportunists out there that uh, want to make uh, uh, movies. Uh, based on the uh, on the broken circle, many of, you know many of us find broken circle uh, offensive. Uh, in in particular, when he refers to our people, uh, the, the ones that have drinking problems, as winos wobbling up and down the streets of Farmington. Page ninety six, broken circle. That's what they think of us. You have, we have great authors, professors uh, amongst us, Navajo, that don't talk that way in uh, their border town research and reports and dissertations and books. Cheryl Redhorse Bennett and her family are among us. Uh, and in 19, 2022, she wrote a book we have just begun to fight from one of the signs that, uh, that, uh, uh, you know, that the marchers were, uh, uh, were carrying back then. I think that might have been the second or third march. And uh, hate crimes and justice in Native America. Focusing primarily on farm things. In Kirtland, she had a very, ugly, uh, very ugly encounter with racism in Animus Valley Mall when she was just four years old. Uh, and, and we have uh, uh, other Navajo professors and book authors uh, that wrote another book uh, in 2020, 2021 called Red Nation Rising, From Border Town Violence to Native Liberation, examining uh, border towns across America and uh, developing a framework to, uh, to deal, for Indian people to deal with the border town problem on our terms, on our terms, because we're on the receiving end. 
And uh, we also have uh, Lisa Weber uh, Danielson uh, among us. Uh, came down from Wyoming and she wrote a 2006 uh, her PhD dissertation, doctoral dissertation on uh, racism and police brutality uh, here in Farmington. And, uh, she's among us and uh, Jennifer Dennettdale and uh, Melanie Yazzie who are two of the Navajo co-authors of that book, Red Nation Rising, are among us also. We have very important, very influential people amongst us. Jennifer also uh, uh, chairwoman of the Navajo Nation Human Rights Commission. After the Clint John shooting, uh, then Chili Yazzie, Irvin Keeswood, and others uh, uh, took steps to form the, uh, the Navajo Nation Human Rights Commission. And, uh, under uh, Jennifer's uh, leadership, uh, you know, it's really turned into a, an effective uh, advocate for our people. They've had hearings, they have studies, and uh, it grew out of that. Uh, Chile uh, uh, was, uh, was a member for a long time of the New Mexico State Human Rights Commission. And, you know, he, he's always been consistent, a consistent champion of our rights of our civil rights and our human rights. Uh, he's always been there, uh, you know, with his drum group organizing out on the Eastern Navajo, personal, you know, the counselor, that area there, we had great numbers of people that caravaned on in. Fred Johnson said, I want you and your cohorts to go out there and organize on the Eastern side, and that's what he did. Chile was there when, when he was needed. And, uh, and of course, he, he too, like Stella Webster, were victims of hate crimes. You know, Chile uh, yeah, took a bullet there. Uh, uh, reservation uh, violence in real terms, but uh, yeah, that has defeated him. That's made him stronger. So he is one of our heroes too, our champions. And uh, we really need his leadership. We really need his integrity. So he is a, a blessing, a great blessing uh, to the Total Navajos. Here. And so, you know, uh, there are many inaccuracies in, in, in Broken Circle uh, and historical inaccuracies, factual inaccuracies. It makes stuff up, uh, calls it literary license, and then they want to make, you know, and then he wants to option the book to, you know, make movies out of it so they can, you know, show winos uh, wobbling up and down the streets of Farmington and, you know, making us look less than human, as savages. You know, you get a white guy doing that. None of our, none of our authors, none of our scholars described our people that way. Because, you know, there are people, human beings. Sure, some of them have trouble with alcohol, it makes them easy, easy prey for hate crimes, uh, but, you know, there's that love as they're caring for our people. And so that should be in, uh, you know, the, the curriculum, San Juan College, the Native American program, uh, Danak College, uh, and, you know, people need to know this, you know, some people don't even know who Fred Johnson is. Uh, we know who uh, Leonard Peltier is, uh, you know. Our hero, and you know, I remember Russell Means came here in 1990, and uh, people, you know, he came here to hold a press conference on a project he was working on, and uh, he was telling uh, the people were telling him, the people that showed up were telling him, people who they called street people, and they said, you know, Russell was talking about the hate crimes in 1974. And he said, Russell, it's still going on, it's still going on. And I knew some of these uh, so-called street people. I grew up with them. Uh, most of them have since passed on. But, uh, yeah, they knew the reality in the mean streets of Farmington. Uh, so, uh, I, you, know, I, uh, you know, there's more I could say, uh, but, you know, this, I'm hoping that this is a historical day, and I'm glad the uh, Total Theater, the... The uh, jewel of downtown Farmington uh, is being used for purposes such as this. I mean, they could they could have torn this down and 
you know, putting something else up here. But it's been here since 1948, and I remember coming here many times. And uh, uh, so, you know, it, it's good that, uh, that uh, you know, that, that, that we have a, a facility, uh, you know, to meet and to dialogue and to collaborate for positive and constructive change for our people instead of having to do it at an inadequate facility, you know, like, uh, uh, well, you know, this is this is the right this is the right uh, the right place to do it, and hopefully the you know the right time to begin this process of healing. But we we got to have a say in this healing, and there are other strategies to deal with racism and hate. But uh, you know, this is you know this is one way. Uh, but you know, we also uh, in the reality th reality of things uh, have to think about have to think outside the box to ensure our survival as a people in our homeland. Thank you. Thank you, Brother John. It's, it's good to uh, see you. You honor us with your visit, my brother. Yeah. Uh, we need to, uh, let's back it up a little bit to the first slide. We do need to uh, uh, get on with the program. We had asked some of the folks to, to talk, but uh, we're just so far uh, over time that uh, we're just gonna start concluding our program. We do wanna share with you some pictures. Uh, Jonah? As you can see here, we're talking about pictures from uh, 1974. And again, quoting uh, Norman Brown, it was a moment of the greatness, okay? This is uh, one of the families, Herman D. Benali's family. Uh, ben, are you still here? Ben was here with us earlier. He's the, the guy that's holding up the sign. Okay, now on the shot. This is uh, Lucy Kiswit, my, my big sister. She's the, she was the, uh, the main mover. She was the brain, she was our leader. And uh, we just honor her so much, okay. Here's uh, Lucy and Mary again. Mary's here with us. And uh, uh, we, we, sometime we, we refer to Fred as one of our greatest modern time than the leaders. Here he is, Fred and uh, Reverend Billy Cleaver who was with uh, NAACP at the time, okay. Okay, and this is uh, Larry. This is when we were, at the time, when we were doing the marches, yeah, we had caravans coming in from every direction. And this caravan was coming in from Arizona through Shiprock. We stopped at the old hogback uh, turquoise bar, yeah. Because yeah. a lot of our people got hurt there. So that's where Larry uh, is talking here. You can see the, the hot back mountain there, okay? And here's uh, No, no, no explanation needed. <laughs> the main man. Okay. And this is uh, Henry, Reverend Henry Bird. Uh, Bill, would you stand? When, when, uh, when our movement at the time needed a place to take a rest, some place to eat, this man provided, us, provided that place across the river, the old little church there, First Escom uh, Escapalian Church, and he's, uh, he's one that we, we greatly honor. 
Bill, thank you for being with us. Okay. Here's uh, Travis, a really, uh, really uh, giving us the fire and brimstone. Ah, uh, look, that Fred is right there again. Okay. He's one of our lead, uh, mar march leaders. See our young people there and the pe all the people behind them, okay? Here's our grandmas, Sani, our matriarchs, leading, them, leading on one of the marches, okay? Pictures from some of the uh, marches. You can keep going. This uh, guy in a white shirt is uh, me. As you can see, I'm, I'm slamming away on the drum with uh, singing the, the AIM song with my right arm, yeah. I can say that I've been a victim of uh, white racial violence. In uh, June 27, 1976, or seven, 78, I picked up a hitchhiker in Chevron up on the hill right here outside of Farmington. He had a poncho, yeah, so I never knew what was, what, what was going on. But he shot me right up here on top of the hill. And uh, he took my, my arm off. The first bullet hit the bone, the big bone, the big bone, yeah, and it, and it all blew inside me. The shrapnel, the bull, the, uh, the bullet fragments, bone fragments. He shot me again down below. It went all the way through. A 44 Magnum, two times. And uh, the, the Earth Mother was kind to me. A great creator was kind to me so I could be here with you today. Okay. This is our Coalition for Navajo Liberation sign. And uh, oh yeah, back it up. This is Esther right here, over there. Then uh, some of these men, yeah, lit, uh, the white shirt with the black hat, that's Ben Dawes. Otto beside him is George Lewis. Those were really grassroots, the Neh men people that, that formed the, the net rights organization, even back then, yeah. Really grassroots, like some of these guys, they hardly went to school. We were just so proud of them to, to, to carry on their leadership, okay? And here's a good one. It says, Farmington is on Indian land. That's the truth. All these communities, Farmington, Aztec, Bloomfield, they are on stolen lands. Okay. Here's uh, some mighty warriors here. Fred's in the truck right there, and Travis Lovalo is in the middle, and I think that's probably Lorenzo driving. Okay. All right, here's Larry. Here, Larry is, is uh, singing with us. Okay. One last shot. No, no shot. This is one of our big marches past the old uh, A and W. We're going west on Maine. No, no shot. Here's what uh, John talked about that day that they stood down the, the Farmington police. Show the next picture. It's Fred and uh, Jimmy Anderson. They were, they were facing off with the police that day. 
And this is the day that um, Lorenzo, as uh, John is saying, Lorenzo was the leader of that day when they confronted the, uh, the Mount at Calvary. Yeah. These guys were on horseback. They say we're the 7th Calvary. And uh, our leaders didn't, didn't agree with that right here. Uh, they even threw tear gas to the people. And here's Lorenzo throwing one of them back. right out here on Broadway. We just passed that place. And this guy, he, he just walked into it. This, uh, <laughs> he must have been a goofy white guy. He didn't <laughs> just walked into a situation and he got arrested that day. <laughs> Rodney is the one that uh, wrote that book, Broken Circle. Then uh, another picture of uh, of one of the, the guys getting arrested, Wilbert Soce. Okay, here's the cavalry guy back right there. That's how they were all uh, dressed. And this is uh, the one that uh, also John referenced, James R. Toulouse. Uh, Tamaya, would you stand, you and your son? Oh, they left, okay. But this is, this, these, these guys, these white men, they, they're good, good people, yeah. Good hearts, and they really helped us at the time. So there, Yahad John Dulles, he was the director of the United States Civil Rights Commission. They came to town, and they, they put Farmington and said, you are hurting these people. Stop it. So he's a good friend. He's still in the uh, Denver area. So that concludes uh, the, the little picture show that we have here. And <clears throat> Cheryl, are you here? Cheryl, please stand. Cheryl Redhouse Bennett. She wrote a book of that, of that name, yeah. Our fight has just begun. Look for it, it's on Amazon. And other places you can buy that book. It tells everything about what we've been talking about here. She did an extensive research about it. She did a good job with that book. Thank you, Cheryl. Okay, we, we went through all of the honorees here and uh, with the families that are still here and our honorees that, that uh, we want to honor here in, in our Denawaya. Uh, then in our, our indigenous way, Jay, we sing a song for them. We call it honor song. And we call in on my da Alvin to, to, to do that for us here. <laughs> We're honoring the victims, the families, and our, our important people that all help on this cause. Oh, yeah, eh. I dance it, oh, Jida, oh, Nazo Jida, Jinne. Tanzania ain't seen no touch in the buses team. Now, Kerry Nana said, Che, I'll talk about Honest and Nelly. I don't call all these keys, which are that KA, A, A, Shamant, A, and Himant, A, Esther Dawes, it's a Ledal window, and there's none in it, and A, Clive Garland, the husband, so A, Kodishi, A, Shadda, A, Kodaha, Gato, Sitzella, Dalvin, are you still here? Hako, Stella. Oh, come on up here. <laughs> oh, and this is, uh, we started singing back in 78. And uh, I, I, was going, I was going to school at Curtin High School, and our band teacher, Miss Brooks, she must have really liked my brother, Irvin, my late brother. And uh, he'd always do different scenes and stuff like that. And that lady, white lady, found out we're, we're in the powwows, and she gave, us, uh, she gave me a bass drum. And that's how we started singing years ago. And one of the first places we, I learned how to sing was at the AIM camp on the, on the bluffs uh, back then. So this is our younger brother, Delvin. And through that, we started a drum group called Sun Eagle Singers. And, uh, and that was history. And my younger brother here was our lead singer. So we're going to sing an honor song. And it's, uh, it's for everyone to heal today.
In a sinigi to a uh, just a couple introductions. Lagos T. Chuga, Percy Deal, Lien Lates, Litchin, Bogade, Aden Khanya. Percy, a great leader of the Navajo Nation. Another introduction. We didn't get the mayor or anybody from the city government yet, but we do have somebody from the government. Brian Lee, are you here? Brian. Brian was here earlier. He's from the office of, the, of our senator, 
بن ری لو ہون یہ ہے اور یہاں وی ول گو ہیڈ اینڈ ڈو اور کلوزنگ وی ہیڈ ایس وکی ویٹکر ٹو میک سم کامس آن دی ہوائٹ ریسزم ہے جو اے وکی ویبس ویٹکر اے اے پہ لگانا اکو پہ لگ آ پہ لگانا لینے کی اے کھو اے پہ لگانا اے کھو اے کیا ہے تینے کی یہ یہ چین ہے تو تزے شو ہے خونی تے گو یہ اے تے جو پا ہنو سی جو ان خائی دے تو نیش پہ دیو بی اپٹونیٹی تو تا خود چیتا دی نانش اے کھو اے نانش سو دے لے ناس اے یہا اے اے تے اے تے دو لیش اکو اے وی کن اسکا وکی ویٹکر تو کم بیک اینا اینا بی ویس اس Um, Brother James, come on up. We want you to take some time here and talk a little bit about some this issue, and then at the same time, we're going to ask you to uh, dismiss us with uh, a, a, a brief blessing. Thank you, Chile. Thank you all. Yaate. I'm Reverend Dr. James Kloss. I'm the pastor at First Presbyterian here in Farmington, and our sister Stella is one of our ruling elders. I bring you greetings from the church and from the Presbytery of Santa Fe. I want to speak to you just for a moment, I promise only a moment, about the importance of memory to the task of commitment in the cause of hope. I acknowledge that the land on which I live, work, worship, and play is the Tota. The land along these three rivers is the land of the ancestral Puebloans. It is the land of the Diné, and it's also the land of the Nuchu. Most acknowledgments given by white people end here, but I won't end here. The Christian church which I serve was complicit in the violence perpetrated on all these peoples by Europeans and their descendants. The doctrine of discovery, which was promulgated by the Western church in the 15th century was only the beginning in a long series in ways in which the church gave spiritual license and legal cover for the exploitation and theft of land and people over the centuries. My own church tradition was complicit in traumas like the Long Walk, in philosophies like Manifest Destiny, in institutions like the residential schools that stripped native children of their culture and language, in practices like overt discrimination in justice and education and economics, and in our willingness to turn a blind eye toward racial violence against our native siblings. As we've heard today, the events of 1974 did not occur in a vacuum, and that's why the resistance movement that arose over 50 years ago has been and is still now so powerful. Today, we honor the memories of the men who were murdered in those acts of brutal racial hatred We honor their families, and we honor all those who raise their voices and hands to say no more. In my faith tradition, we often speak about confession and repentance and forgiveness, and heaven knows we've abused that theology sometimes. But I think it's helpful to our task today and to our next steps together and how we understand the importance of memory to our future. Confession of wrongdoing, expressions of repentance, seeking of forgiveness will ring hollow, it will ring false, unless there is real commitment to changing the present and working toward a better future. As Sister Stella mentioned, I'm kind of new here, but I do have family here in New Mexico, including my beloved auntie, who served for decades as a school psychologist on the Navajo Nation, working with Diné children and their families, seeing firsthand the real tragic results of generational trauma. But I myself, I'm from Georgia, you probably heard from my accent, and I attended college in rural Southeast Alabama. As a young man living in the Deep South, I witnessed a remarkable transformation about how we remembered the events of the Civil Rights Movement. For decades, it seemed like to many in power and influence, the way to deal with real ugliness, real violence in our past was to sweep it under the rug, to look forward to things like the New South or cities too busy to hate. But a shift has happened in the last two decades. Cities, large and small, have begun a reckoning with that violent history, to acknowledge it honestly. In Atlanta, in Birmingham, Montgomery, in Selma, memorials and museums have risen. In Birmingham at 16th Street Baptist Church, the memorial to those four little girls murdered by a white supremacist terrorist bomb 
refuses to ignore that past. And it calls all who make their pilgrimages there to ask themselves, so what do we do now? In Selma, the King Monument stands witness along with the Pettus Bridge to all those of all races who died in the March for Voting Rights in 1965. It names that violent history, but it silently asks those who flock to Selma to make their pilgrimages across the bridge, where's this bridge gonna take us together now? These communities across my native South have found that permanent physical memorials to a difficult past play a hugely important role in helping the community cast a shared vision for the future. A community without a shared story is unanchored and aimless. A community that owns its history, warts and all, mourning the violence of the past while celebrating the long process of activism and hard work that overcame it, that community feels a spirit, a shared purpose, that spirit of we shall overcome. My friends, we in the Tota, especially in the city of Farmington, we've got a unique opportunity right now. It's an opportunity that comes to a town like this only once in a generation if not once in a century. The work we are doing together today is important, it is vital, it is life-giving, and that work cannot end today. The permanent memorial that we are planning is just an important beginning. It will give us, we hope, a focal point as a community, a place of memory in which we anchor our hope for a better future together. It will stand as a witness calling us to be the community that does something about missing and murdered indigenous women and missing and murdered indigenous relatives. It is the witness to us that will call us to get loud, calling out quiet racism. It will stand as a permanent reminder and a call to our commitment to a Farmington, to a Tota, that is a place where all peoples share the fruits of prosperity, of freedom, and of justice. So... On behalf of my colleagues on the Commemorative Committee, I invite you to join us as we seek to continue the work we've started today, the work of memory that will fire our present commitment to the urgent task of hope for the future. Because deep in my heart, I do believe we shall overcome someday. I hear you. And now as we prepare to break bread together, I ask you, as you feel led, to join me in a brief prayer. Holy One, Spirit of creation, you who created all of us in your image, we give you thanks for this time to join together, to tell our stories together, to cast our vision for the future. We thank you for one another. We thank you for all the hands that have prepared these meals. We ask that you will bless them. Bless our time together. O oh, Creator, help us to walk together in beauty. Amen. Yeah, brother, brother James. Um, Shema, uh, Stella, why don't you go up and uh, make us the Make the last announcement, and then we can move on. You want to hear this announcement because it's about food. <laughs> we have lunches for you. We have ushers available to help you uh, with your meals. And we also have a bus that will, a city bus that's available to take people back to their cars. And it's at Main and Block, at the intersection of Main and Block. There's a city bus for transportation if you need to go back to your vehicle, if you, wherever you parked. So, Thank you very much. We are very proud that we were together today to commemorate 
uh, or, or, or um, resistance in 1974. We are proud that we can honor the victims and the families. We will be back together. Uh, one last announcement for for the healing party. So Stella has put together multiple resources for healing. There are tents outside, and we're going to have a panel discussion here inside the TOTA. That was scheduled to begin at 1.30, but we'll take a little break, make sure everybody gets something to eat, and then come back in. But please visit the tents that are outside after you eat. Thank you all. So let's go chow and have a, a good happy trip going home. A safe trip. And there you have it, here from the Farmington Tota Theater in downtown Farmington. Scott Micklin with you once again on KSJE, our On the Road program. We thank you for joining us. Uh, quite a lot of information, quite a lot of emotion in this uh, event that has been happening here at the Tota. As uh, has been mentioned, there is still uh, more to come downtown in Farmington. Our coverage will end, but there is lots going on still on Main Street here in front of the Tota Theater. And uh, we invite you to uh, come down and uh, take a look at the other uh, booths and things that are here um, to assist in uh, healing and uh, reflection. But uh, certainly lots of, uh, lots of information, lots of stories shared today at this very important and commemorative event here at Farmington's Tota Theater. Again, we are here and we are remembering um, the victims of past racial violence in Farmington and remembering that it is not uh, the end of racial violence. Several speakers of today said that things are certainly much improved than they were in 1974, but there is still um, acts of racial violence that continue and uh, happen in our community, in our communities. And so that has been uh, reminded to all of us today. And then a lot of talk about a permanent memorial, a permanent um, statue or some type of memorial to commemorate Farmington's past and perhaps maybe even its uh, its future, which will be on this path of less racial violence in our communities. Uh, I'm Scott Micklin. We thank you for joining us uh, this morning. Again, thanks to our sponsors for our KSJE On the Road programs that make this all possible. Uh, we really appreciate uh, their support as well, or else we wouldn't be able to, uh, to continue to do this uh, each and every time. We have a busy On the Road schedule, so you can always follow our KSJE Facebook page and our YouTube channel to get all the data most information of where we'll be uh, next time. But uh, thank you from the Tota Theater. Thank you for being with us, of course, and we hope you have a good rest of your Saturday. From the Tota Theater in downtown Farmington, I'm Scott Micklin. This is KSJE on the road. KSJE On the Road is supported by Four Corners Economic Development, supporting and building economically vibrant businesses and communities in the Four Corners region through effective partnerships. Forsed is a public-private partnership that unites county and municipal governments with its member businesses and other resource partners to build the intentional economic future of San Juan County. Learn more about the ways Forsed is helping existing businesses thrive and grow and attracting new businesses to the community at the number 4 cornersed.com. At San Juan County Partnership, our mission is a thriving and healthy community. We strive to achieve this through educating our youth about eating healthy, moving every day, 
and the harmful effects of alcohol, tobacco, and other drugs. We educate adults about access to health care, the dangers of polysubstance use, and drinking and driving. We work hard to keep families housed and to help those without permanent shelter have a place to call home. We are here for you. We are San Juan County Partnership. KSJE On the Road is supported by Kaiser Millennium Levitt Insurance Agency with local offices in Farmington and Durango. Kaiser Millennium Levitt Insurance provides their clients a consultative, customized approach for discovering and mitigating risk. Their four-step comprehensive approach includes commercial insurance, employee benefits, personal insurance, and proactive safety and HR tools for growth-oriented businesses. Kaiser Millennium Levitt Insurance Agency. There are days when the weight of the world is heavy on your shoulders. But there is something you should know. You are never alone. There are beautiful people in this world who will walk with you when you feel off course, guide you when you need it most. They are there for you. And they're closer than you think. KSJE On the Road is supported by San Juan County, building a stronger community since 1887. San Juan County includes the San Juan County Sheriff's Office, San Juan County Fire and Rescue, San Juan County Office of Emergency Management, and Riverview Golf Course in Kirtland. The mission of San Juan County is to provide responsible public services through the direction of the county commission, while striving to be professional, courteous, and committed to improving the quality of life for citizens that it serves. Learn more at sjcounty.net. I love my job. I make a difference in someone's life today. 911, what is the address of your emergency? Please help me, my child. Sending the paramedics to help you to stay the ward. The payoff to know that my career provides someone with the help they need when they need it. That's why I do what I do. 